Welcome to the Wealth Juice Podcast, where we discuss all things real estate, personal finance, investing, entrepreneurship, and the many ways to achieve financial independence. We interview accomplished investors and entrepreneurs with the goal that their stories inspire you to take control of your financial future. Here to get your creative juices flowing while also documenting their own personal investing journeys are your hosts, Corey Jacobson and Ryan Bevilacqua. Welcome back to the Wealth Juice Podcast. As always, it's your boy, Ryan, with another episode for you today. I'm going to be covering the show for Corey and I. We had special guest Isabel Gorino on the show. She specializes in residential assisted living, which is a very niche down strategy in real estate. And it goes into the process of buying a single family home and converting that to almost like a senior living home. Um, it's really about putting a business inside of a property. So uh, she mentioned some crazy cash flow numbers on some of these deals from netting an additional five to 15 K per property. Now, a lot of these properties that you would have to buy or build are very specific to this niche. So she mentions needing, you know, put it, looking for a single level home with six plus units. So it's very, like I said, very specific. But the idea here is to provide housing for senior citizens in a luxury type feel. So instead of going to a nursing home, you would have a care team come in and kind of run the business for you. And as an investor, you can make a lot of cash flow with this. And um, for the business side, it's really nice to be able to provide a an amazing source of housing for people that really need it. We went into a lot of tips and tricks on how to become a residential assisted living investor um, and who it makes sense for and who it doesn't. We talked about a few different sample deals. We went into the business side of things. So what team members you need to put on your team in order to be able to run this successfully and then how to analyze deals and what are the right types of properties you should be looking for. So we really went through the timeline of everything from A to Z on RAL or residential assisted living. This is the first time we've chatted about it on the podcast and um, Isabel has been a, on a lot of big, big shows. So she is, um, I would say one of the masters of this niche and has helped over 60,000 people generate over $30 million in revenue. And that's just her students. So she has students from all the way in Vermont, all the way over to Arizona. So she covers the entire United States. And we'll drop in the show notes uh, ways you can get in touch and network if you're looking to potentially check out our coaching program. So without further ado, let's bring in Isabel. Isabel, officially welcome to the Wealth Juice podcast. I'm so excited to have you on the show. As I mentioned, uh, just going to be you and me today, so it'll be a fun one. But uh, if you could, give a little brief, brief background on yourself, who you are, where you're from, and then kind of how you got into real estate investing. Yeah. Well, thanks for having me on the show. I'm excited to be here. Uh, I really got started in residential assisted living fully. That's the only thing that I have focused all my efforts on. My dad had been a real estate investor my whole life, um, 30 plus years before jumping into this realm. So I saw the life of a real estate investor with wholesale and fix and flip and, you know, larger units, you know, commercial apartments and this and that and the other. And none of it interested me. It sounded like a whole lot of headaches. So when he started doing residential assisted living, because my grandmother, she fell, broke her hip and needed assisted living, it made a whole lot of sense for him to go into this route after already having some background in real estate. So that was the first time in my whole life when I looked at anything he was doing and said, what's going on here? I want to, I want to dig in. I want to learn more. And I really just started learning the business from him. And that was 14 years ago now that we purchased our first uh, RAL home, our first residential assisted living home. Now we own and operate three of them, invest in a bunch across the country, and have taught thousands how to do this as well. And my dad passed in 2021. And so all of his homes and businesses got passed on to me which made me even more excited about sharing with other people how to do this because there's so many parents who own businesses who they would not seamlessly transition from one generation to the other. So being able to have that is huge. And now I want to show every parent how to be able to leave, you know, blessings, not burdens. Wow. There's so much we can go into here. So my dad owns a business. I know a bunch of other dads that own businesses, if you will, yeah. and passing them down. It's funny. It's, it's a construction business. And I always thought, I'm like, you know, when the time comes, I don't know that we would have any idea what to do. 
Yeah. Luckily, my brother works for him. Okay. And so like kind of like the second in command and like it's still, you know, eventually he'll take over. But my fear is still in the back of my head is like, well, everyone runs their ship differently, right? You can yeah. have the SOPs, the KPIs, all of it. But when you get down to it, how do you like officially change the guard? Is it, it's going to be new life in there? So it's interesting. I definitely want to talk about that. But yeah. can you break it down like super elementary in the beginning? Hit me with RAL and what that means just for like a new first time investor that might be like, hey, listen, I'm, I'm not quite into real estate yet. I'm thinking about buying my first rental property, but this sounds really intriguing. Should I maybe go this route first? Yeah. I love it. So residential assisted living, when you think of assisted living, you probably think of a commercial facility, right? Like a hundred units, those big, big buildings that we all pass by the Brookdale sunrise atrium. That is not what this is. It is a residential home in a single family neighborhood that's being used to house somewhere between six and 16 residents in that home. They have private bedrooms, private bathrooms, 24 seven care and help with their activities of daily living. They get food and medication management and everything that they would get in that large facility, but in a home setting. And so it's really enticing for a lot of people because they say, don't put me in that facility. You know, don't, don't leave me there. Well, this is that option because it's very expensive to stay at home and have one-on-one -on -one care. So the cost is relatively the same in comparison from that facility to these type of homes, but it's that in-between option. Maybe it's not your home, but at least it's a home. So that's super interesting. And, and I'm probably giving a ton of like personal information here, but which is fine. My, my grandmother's in a, like a commercial facility, if you yeah. will. And it, it's not, I'm thinking about me, right? We have a bunch of residential homes that we rent out, but could I potentially pivot and have one that houses, I don't know, senior living, et cetera. Take me through, and the, actually before I get there, the reason I brought that up is because it's so interesting. We went through that, don't put me in this home, yeah. you know, and like there's the big fear there. And then, hey, it costs a lot of money to put someone in one of those homes. And because of all the care they get on a daily basis, medications, there's nurses yeah. that come through, there's a lot. So I'd imagine as we pivot to RALs and kind of getting into like, well, there's got to be some, you know, hoops and things to get through. Like I'm thinking about the staff that you got to bring in. There's a, there's a lot going through my brain. So yeah. maybe take me to the investor that, you know, buys their, you know, single family residence and they're thinking about renting it out to a traditional tenant. That's where yeah. my brain is. Where do you go from here to pivot to potentially getting, turning it into a facility? Yeah. So if you have a home, you know, that you're considering, okay, am I going to do a single family rental with this or potentially an RAL? There are a lot more expenses involved with the RAL, right? But the profitability is astronomically higher. Let's think of this. The one family who's living in that home, maybe you're able to charge them a thousand or may, maybe, you know, even $500 more than your mortgage alone is, right? So you're making 500 to a thousand bucks a month off of that family. When it's being used as a residential assisted living home and you can have somewhere between six and 16 residents in that home, let's call it 10 for easy math. The average in our country today is $5,500 per month per resident. So with 10 residents, that's 55,000 coming in, your expenses are higher. Just like you said, well, I've got to hire staff and, you know, I got to feed them and do activities and all of this stuff. So your expenses might range you like 35K a month. And if the mortgage on that home is 10,000, okay, great. You're still cash flowing 10K a month on that home. So one family where you're cash flowing 500 or a thousand bucks a month or use it as an RAL and cash flow 10 K a month, it's for you, it's the same home, but there is more profitability to be had and you're servicing a population and a demand that our market is begging for people to jump in. Yeah, it's, it's, this is super intriguing. So my thought is when you, I guess you could run the numbers uh, while you're analyzing deals and things like this, but is this good in every market? Or is it very like, hey, you want to find a home closer to maybe a city? Or I'm trying to figure out, we have people from you know, all the way to Massachusetts, all the way to California that might be like, whoa, this sounds interesting, but will it fit my demographic, my market? How do we make it work? I love that question. So we have students in all 50 states who we've shown how to do this, which is a great thing because it's already been done before you, so you don't have to reinvent the wheel, which I love. I will say this, there are some easier states and some harder states. Nothing is easy, right? But business friendly states are a lot easier, right? Take that comment as you will, right? 
because this is a business at the end of the day. It's not just real estate. You're literally creating a business. Now, demographics wise, any state may work, but where in the state? You want to be in the area where the majority population is 50 to 70 years old, upper middle class, making twice the median income, usually college grads and homeowners. That is not the senior living in the home. That's the adult child of the senior living in the home. They're the ones who get that call to say, you know, mom or dad's dementia has progressed or they fell and broke their hip or whatever it is hey, you need to find a place for them. And they don't want to drive 45 minutes outside of town because it's cheaper. They want to drive five minutes on their way home from work because they want the illusion that they're going to go visit every day or every Sunday or whatever it is. So you want to be near the adult children who are more affluent because those are the ones who can afford to put granny in the home. 100%. I love that. It's good stipulation to make. It's immediately people would go to, well, how much does the senior make, right? But it's the kids that you yeah. need to focus on. That's so interesting. So tell me about your market. Where are you guys? And is this, have you spanned across the whole, whole United States? Or are you kind of in one little pocket? So my homes are all here in the Phoenix uh, and Scottsdale, Arizona market. We have students in all 50 states. So we've kind of helped people through the regulations all over. So it's it's possible everywhere, right? But in Arizona, where we started, it was for the intent to move my grandmother in. And so again, we were the daughter of Judy's. We wanted her as close to us as possible. So even though she lived in upstate New York, we were like, we're not going out there. We want you five minutes from us. So we put them as close to us as we could. Arizona is obviously also, you know, a, a market that's much like Florida, where we do have that aging population here, which can be a pro and it can be a con because in Maricopa County alone, the county where my homes are, there are 3,000 group homes in that county alone, right? There's only 30,000 group homes across the country. So to have... 10% of that in one county, my, you know, competition is out the wazoo versus if you go to Vermont, where we have the first student who opened care homes in Vermont, she doesn't have any competition. She's one of one. She has a waiting list, you know, and people begging her to open more homes. So there's pros and cons to everywhere because it may be easier to start in a market like Arizona where the rules are laid out. A lot of people have gone before you. The path is paved. But if you go to a market where there is a massive demand and no supply, bread and butter. I mean, you've got to you've got to work through it to get it done. But you are making hand over fist. Yeah, it's it's so interesting that you mentioned that. Uh, it's we so I, we were recently out in in Phoenix and Scottsdale. It's beautiful. It's so hot, but it reminds me of the snowbirds. We'll definitely go there. Right? It's it's its own little paradise, if you will. Yeah. And I'm thinking about all the different markets. Like Vermont is. I've also been to Vermont too. It's it's just extremely rural. They're yeah. what do they call them, the Vermonsters. There's so many like different types of people, very granola out there. But and I'm I'm thinking specifically to this niche. It's so interesting. Can you take me to some of these regulations? Because as an investor, I'm thinking, okay, that sounds amazing. Like who wouldn't want 10 plus in cash flow per month? Yeah. But I know there's hoops because it sounds so good. Yeah. And so maybe take us through some of those. And like, I'm thinking of, you know, let's just say like someone that's going to burr something or they're going to flip something. You're thinking about the permits that you need to pull and all that. That's like the, one of the initial hoops for you, like built, putting a business into an existing property that you buy or one that you're going to buy. I'm just hoping you can give me some of the red tape that you kind of have to walk by and uh, maybe some of the things that you look for, right. When you, when you're purchasing a home. Yeah. Well, Basically, once you have decided what you're going to do with that home, because there's really four ways you could lease a home to use for this, buy a single family home and convert to become an RAL, buy land and custom build from the ground up, or uh, buy an existing RAL, purchasing the real estate in the business. So all four of those ways kind of lead you down a little bit different paths. But regardless, you're going to need to get licensed through the state. That license is going to be about emergency egress. It's going to be about the certificate of need, the square footage in the home and how many you know residents you can comfortably accommodate with wheelchairs and walkers. It's about ramps and guardrails, handrails, 
fire suppression or sprinkler systems, all those different things that you have to do that you don't have to do on a regular single family rental, right? Those are the the extras. If it's multi-level, you need to add in a chairlift or add in an elevator, right? So all of those things to get the home fit and suitable for seniors so that they can safely live there, that's what the state is looking for when they give you that stamp of approval and say, okay, you're licensed for eight beds or 16 beds or whatever it is. You also, on the other turn, have to hire your staff because you're not working in the home. You're not living in the home, right? So you need to hire that licensed administrator, which in the real estate world, let's call it the property manager, right? They do the hiring, firing, training, and onboarding of your caregivers. And they also are dealing with the state to get those policies and procedures and documents approved and get that go ahead. They do the marketing and the touring for the new residents. So that is your key hire, A number one. That manager is that person you are really relying on and it's really helping you kind of create and build this business. So the physical home has its requirements to get approved through the state. And then your staffing has their requirements because your administrator is licensed, your caregivers are licensed, and then you need the documents to show the state you know what you're doing and here's here's what we follow in our home. So there's a lot of things that go on, which is why you know it, it's not the most common real estate investing strategy because so many people are turned off by the hoops you have to jump through. To me, I love the hoops because if you're not willing to jump through the hoops, you shouldn't be in this industry. This is people's lives at stake. It's not just a, a, a building. It's not just a piece of land. These are people's lives and you should be willing to jump through every hoop and more. And there, I, I like the regulations because they keep the riffraff out. They keep people who who just want to make a quick buck out. It has to. And it's it's good that you bring that up because I think a lot of times when we, we talk on the show, it's like or when when people listen to podcasts in general, right? It's usually from the the lens of an investor and they're thinking about the numbers all the time and they forget you're providing housing for people, right? It's one of the most important things that anyone needs. You need food, shelter, how um, food, shelter, and transportation, right? Those are some of the three of the big things. So it's just interesting to me, you know, kind of as we walk through this, I think a lot of people will be turned on by it. And then as soon as you get to the regs, they're like, eh, it sounds good, but I think I'm going to stick to what I know. Yeah. Now, let me ask you this. We, we kind of did two buckets here. One was on the specific property and then it was like getting the right person in place kind of as a property manager. Yeah. Let's start to talk properties. And when people are going out and they're hunting deals down and they're looking for properties, I know we get a bunch of things sent to us by wholesalers. We're all looking on the MLS and then there's obviously a ton of off-market deals. So what should people be looking for in terms of like the best suited housing for an RAL? You mentioned sometimes 10 to 12 people in there. Are you talking this has to be a 12 unit or it's a bedroom for each person? Like how's the scope work? Yeah, I love that. The state will give you a lot lower requirements than I'm going to tell you because we always recommend doing things above average, above and beyond so that you knock the state regulations out of the park, but you also knock the adult child who's coming over to tour the home. You want to knock her socks off. You want her to say, oh, I could see myself living here. So our recommendation is 300 to 500 square feet per resident. So if you had 10 residents, minimum a 3,000 square foot home, upwards of 5,000 is very comfortable. Most seniors, they want private bedrooms. If you can do private bathrooms as well, that is amazing because every person in the home is going to be paying a different rate. So if you have all shared bedrooms, they're going to be paying less than if you had all private bedrooms, right? But I still have the same amount of bills with those same 10 residents. So you do want a larger, more luxurious upscale home, which is why that demographic selection, the 50 to 70 year old upper middle class, twice the median income, they're not living in a 2-1 in a bad part of town. That person is living in a 6-5 in a great part of town, and they probably bought it 10, 15 years ago, if not further back. But that's the neighborhood you want to be in, or at least right next to that neighborhood. So these are larger, more upscale homes. And so there might be something in you know the listener's portfolio that works for it. But it also might be something that they go seek, that they go look for and try to find the perfect home for this because demographics is going to be number one. And then square footage, layout of the home, single levels preferred, you know, multi-level, we'd have to add in that chairlift or elevator. But I do want something that 
I'm, it's not pad split. We're not just splitting up the whole home into bedrooms. No, there still needs to be the dining room, the sitting room, the kitchen. If you can have a movie theater, a library, a hair salon, those things go a long way. So we're definitely talking a luxurious upscale home. Totally. So based on where you're at now, and I'm asking this just because I'm thinking about if I was to start something like this, mm -hmm. is it easier to just do ground up for one of these? Because it's so custom. Um, and, and the reason I ask is like, think about all the properties scoured across the United States to fit that specific bucket you mentioned, optimized for single level with all those bedrooms and the common space and maybe the movie theater. My guess is that it would be good to just, hey, start fresh, find your plot of land and put one up. But you tell me. We do have a lot of students who build custom from the ground up, specifically those who live in areas where you're allowed to have 10 or more residents. When it's less than 10, you can make it work. Like I'm sitting in, I, I'm right now in my house, it's a six, five. We could make this work with seven or eight residents, six, seven or eight residents, fine. And I wouldn't have to do barely any renovations, ramps, guardrails, handrails, simple things. But if we wanted to take this to a 16 bedroom, right, then either I'm having to do a large addition or just chop it up and add a lot of bedrooms within the home. So, yeah, if, it, if you're above 10 residents, it is nice to do a custom build because you can make it perfectly suitable for the seniors. And our students who do that, oh, my God, when you visit their homes, they're like chef's kiss. They're perfect. I'm thinking of these. It's just so fun. I love this type of stuff, especially the design, the Airbnb field, if you will, or that, yeah. that, that lane of investing. That's so fun. I mean, I see your background here. It's got the cow print. And I'm just thinking, I'm not saying that's an Airbnb, but I was out in Scottsdale. We stayed at an Airbnb. It was this big mansion for a bachelor pad, bachelor party. And it was amazing. Like yeah. every room was custom, but I'm thinking you can do this for the, the assisted living as well, right? Like you're making this a place that not only attracts the big money, but also someone wants to live comfortably and have this like special feeling when you get there. You don't want to just be like, I'm go when you're going home, you know, that feeling of like the comfort, the relaxation and the winding down, but also the extra amenities to make you feel extra special and willing to fork up the extra dough. That's where I'm kind of going with this. And, um, I think so personally, I would treat it more as like the Airbnb design side when you finally get one or go custom rather than, you know, it's kind of just taking one, you know, a little bit run down and putting the normal gray walls, the the LVP floors and just the basic stuff you would do on a flip. Yeah. Um, there's so many ways you can go about this, but maybe what you could do, this would be fun. Can you take us through, because I see here, you know, we talked about maybe netting an extra five to 15 K in cash flow. I think that's sexy for anyone yeah. uh, as opposed to the regular, you know, traditional buy and hold model. Can you take us through a deal anyone that you'd like, but like one that you've done or maybe one that your students have done just from like the beginning to end the process of like acquiring then maybe any renovations you put in and just kind of optimizing the home. I know you talked all the strategies all the way through, but sample deals are awesome for us. And just to, to break it down and conceptualize. Yeah, I love that. I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to, I'm thinking I want to share where, where, what state are you in? We are in Pennsylvania, but we invest in, in Jersey too. So we're, Northeast. Okay. Okay. I think I want to share with you one of our students' homes in Virginia then since, cool. since we're out on the East Coast. So we'll go, we'll go East Coast. Okay. Wade is who I'm thinking of. So Wade came to our training. Awesome guy. He um, had been a real estate investor before, but never done anything like this. Um, his wife is Korean and they're just the cutest couple. And so she was like, we've got to get into this. Like I, I have great people who I know we can find for staffing. So they weren't afraid of the team part of it. It was the building part of it. So they actually purchased a home. It was about a million dollars, the home alone. It's out in uh, Alexandria, I think so. I know exactly where it is. Yep, it's, okay. it's right outside of DC. Yep. yep. So a million dollars, which is pretty normal for you know homes out in that area. They put 500K of renovations in. They did fire suppression, so sprinklers. They added a generator. They updated the AC system. They did outdoor fencing. You don't have to make these homes ADA compliant, but it's nice if you do like wheel or roll under sinks and different things of that nature. So he was already doing a big renovation. So he just made it ADA compliant as well. Um, and that's just a nice touch. He converted some bedrooms and added uh, some bathrooms. So it was a five, four, and now it's an eight bedroom, nine bath. He didn't do any addition. He just like the home was 5,300 square feet. So he just chopped it up 
differently. I think he even converted the garage into two rooms as well. So that's something that a lot of people do is use the garage in that way. So his mortgage on that home is right around that 10,000. He did this like maybe, uh, I'm thinking like, gosh, he probably bought this home in 2020, end of 2022 is my guess. Okay. It's been open for a minute now. So, cause it takes some time, right? You buy the home, you've got to renovate it. You've got to market it. You've got to do all this stuff. So end of 2022, 10K on that debt service. His overhead is about $45,000 a month. He's got eight residents and in the DMV area rates are insane. His residents pay $9,500 a month. So he brings in 76,000 after his expenses, he takes home 21,000. He doesn't live in the home. He doesn't work in the home. He just set that up and now he's going to open more, which is pretty cool. Very cool. That, thank you for the breakdown. That was super concise too. Um, it's It seems like a doozy for a lot of people that are listening, I imagine. The the thing that's... It's funny what you say scares people. For me, it's not the building side. It's actually putting the people in the right place and getting... It's the management side, right? And so Team. we still... Uh, my partner and I, we still work our W2s. We manage our portfolio and we got the podcast. We have a lot going on. So if we didn't have a, a stellar property manager... Yeah. We would be in trouble. And that we said, you know, we tried the self-managing for a while. And we're like, you know, just not really feeling all these calls and, and the extra emails and things like that. I do love the the customer service aspect. And, and I know we talked providing housing and the connection with people. But when you're so busy, you got a lot of things going on. You need to put someone in the right, I guess, put the right butt in the right seat in order to manage it for you. So you can, like you said, your, your client in Alexandria or a student for them to be able to just shut off and trust that they have the right person running their ship, it's perfect. Now, it's not easy to generate $20,000 no matter who you are. Even if you run the numbers, you put the place up, you have to put the right person and the right team in order. And this is what I'm scared of. So I want to get into this side of it now. Let's talk to people. And before we get into that, I'm wondering, is this similar to Section 8 when we're talking rules and regs? Like, how do you... is can you warrant a specific amount of, of cat, not cash flow, but um, the rent that you charge these people? Is it basically through a, a program that they would get, or is it just everyone individually, like personalized? Like, a, you know, it'd be like Ryan showing up and just saying, Hey, I want to put my, my mom into this program, or do I have to go to the state to get a funded, you know, it's like a state funded program? Yep. No, it is all private pay. About 10% of the population has long-term care insurance. If someone has that, that's a beautiful way to pay for your care needs. But most, I would say the other 80% uh, in our homes, they're using private pay. So they're using their home that they just sold and they're using that capital to pay for it. They're using their cash, their savings, their IRAs, their pensions, whatever it is. Um, their investments, they're selling that off and using that capital to pay for their care needs or their adult children are paying for their care needs, but it's all private pay. We don't do government funded homes um, because the government only pays about $1,800 per resident. And if you are relying on that, you are going into a home that accepts that and you're eating rice and beans and hot dogs and it's a terrible end of life care. The ratios in those homes will be 50 seniors to one caregiver. It's sick. It's cruel. It should be illegal. I feel terrible. But the only thing that I can do is open homes that cash flow well and give back to seniors in need. If you don't make money, you can't give money. So I feel bad for the scenario, but I've got to do my part and control what I can and provide the best care that we can. So 100%. And anyway. you carved out your own niche for it. So it's good. I, I love it. Thank you. And that was a a long way for me to ask the question, but I was, I'm curious because we had some section eight rentals. We have an yeah. 18 unit and we're converting all the section eight and it's just, it's different, right? It's not, it's not senior living and I'm, I'm yeah. keep saying senior living, but I'm thinking obviously because yeah. the most of the tenants you put in here are senior. Um, so take me through hiring, let's just putting the business plan together is yeah. like where I'm really stuck. And uh, it's not stuck because I know you have that one person that kind of runs the ship, but how many people do you really need to be able to run this at a high efficiency on a monthly basis? I love it. We recommend a four to one or five to one caregiver to resident ratio. So if you do have 10 residents, that's two caregivers on during the day one at night is fine. They usually do a 12 hour shift, kind of like a nurse. 
So your manager, they're not full-time overseeing one home. They usually can oversee two to four homes and that's full-time for them. So their salary is kind of dispersed among how many homes they're overseeing. Your caregivers are doing shift work. So they're coming and going, doing those shifts. They don't live in, they come and go. Uh, and then you'll have other people coming and going. For example, if you're in a more higher end area and you want to add different amenities, you may have a private chef who comes over. You'll probably have some activities, whether it's pet therapy or senior yoga, whatever it is, they'll come over for an hour, do an activity and then head on their way. So there'll be different things like that. PT, OT, that's coming. The resident is paying for any of those extra things that they want or need within the home. Um, and a lot of times even there'll be uh, visitations from doctors because it's no longer that the seniors are able to get up and go to the doctor's office. They like to have an in-home doctor who can come and see them. So they'll swing by, check out the residence and go on to the next home. Wow. Okay. So I thought, and correct me if I'm wrong, but do you have any like traveling nurses? I don't even know if traveling nurses is the, the right phrase, but someone that'll come in. Is that the doctor you just mentioned? Or I, I thought you would have a nurse on staff. I guess I'm wrong. There's no nurse on staff. Most states don't require that. The licensed caregivers can do almost all of the work within the home. So they pass the pills, they help you know lift the seniors, feed them, do everything that they need with them. Um, the doctor will come by, you know, just to do the regular checkups that they do, weigh them, make sure their meds are good, and different things of that nature. Some states do require that you have a med tech or a nurse do the passing of the pill. The the caregivers aren't licensed to do that. If you do, you're not paying a, a nurse's salary. This is a nurse who will hit 20 homes in one day. And they literally come by, pass, count the pills, pass the pills, go, and they're out of there in 15 minutes onto the next home. It is quick. So you're paying them just like a simple fee for them to come by every day and do that for you. Wow. Okay. That's really helpful. So I was thinking that this person would work exclusively for you, but they don't. They There could be a bunch of other housing just like this around the, the local market. Yeah. So take me through this. Um, if people, and if you're not willing to share this, no problem, But because I know it's probably your private company, but I will say there's probably a lot of people that are super intrigued about this and like, hey, how can I see your portfolio or like see a, an example of what this might look like? And the reason I asked that once again is because I have my grandmother. She had to go into assisted living. Yep. And it, it's so interesting. I remember the process. We had wow. to, to go look, make sure it looked clean. Then you had to go meet the people. And almost like we're interviewing to make sure that she's going to be taken care of. And yeah. you know, there's diff different tiers, as you mentioned, the low ball tier, then the mid tier. And then it seems like you guys are in like the luxury tier where we'd really want to be. Yeah. Um, so if people could take a look for pictures, where would they go? Yeah, we actually did a huge project this last year where we took camera crews and went out to students' homes all across the country. So we have about 50 filmed home tours where you're hearing the student story and origin story. You're seeing inside their home. They're walking you through it, showing you everything that they've done. So I can send you the link and we can put it in the show notes. But we have a huge plethora of that, which is really cool. We also created a map called ralhomelocator.com where you can just search and find care homes in your area. They're not all associated with us, but we pulled all of the state sheet lists of all of the care homes and dropped them all in one map. So all 50 states, every care home is listed there. But if you wanna actually see tours and inside, I'll give you the link for that because that's it's really fun. I'm, I'm really proud of that project. You should be. I, I just, trust me, from building couple different businesses and trying to get things off the ground. It's, it's no easy task, whatever lane you're in, yeah. but this is even taking, you know, the basic real estate investing strategy and just pumping it on steroids. And it's, so, but it's so niched down because I know, as we mentioned, so many people will think about trying it and they'll realize there's some hoops and they turn away, right? Everybody yeah. wants the easy path or like 90% of people, but the 10% that are willing to put in the blood, sweat and tears like you, it's extremely profitable. You're providing amazing housing for people and it's something to be proud of. So um, I'm proud of you and uh, we just met. So that's great. Well, thanks. Sure. Um, one thing I wanted to talk about too, and it's really hot in today's topic of the market and where things are at with interest rates, there's a lot of people going down the creative finance side of real estate. And so is there a way to fund these type of deals with creative finance or basically other people's money? And maybe you have an example of a way you've done that, or just kind of just so someone can conceptualize like, Hey, if I don't have 
X, Y, Z dollars saved up for this. How would I go about funding and creating my business? Yeah, we actually really encourage that you do not use your own money for this because this is one of the easier things to raise capital for when you're coming to somebody with this amazing business plan and pro forma and all of these numbers where they're getting 12, 15% returns and it has a heartfelt story around it. It, it, it's unlike raising capital for an apartment, a mall, a storage unit, a car wash. There's no emotional connection. There's no tie to this. Everyone has an elderly loved one in their life who you can pull on those heartstrings and this becomes that opportunity that they're excited about investing in, that they want to take a look at. So definitely we love raising capital for this. I highly encourage people to look at SBA 7A loans. A lot of our students use those for this because it will give you the money for uh, the real estate, the reno and carrying costs. And it will pay you in the meantime to be like the one managing the whole project. So love SBA 7A. A lot of our students uh, use different programs in, in that small business lending section, right? Uh, syndications, huge. A lot of our students work with partnerships and they raise capital with a bunch of other people working in. So we have syndication attorneys that we send our students to if they want to go that direction. And then private money. You know, I'm blessed to share on this topic all across the country and I meet accredited investors all the time who want to work with our top tier students. And so we kind of save all of their info, vet them and put them in a list of private lenders that work with our students so that again, they don't have to use their own money for this. They get to partner with someone after they've been trained by the nation's best on how to do this. Really cool. So we dove in on a lot of different avenues on this and I love it. You're, you have an answer for everything, which is awesome. So I know you're really in the weeds every day on this and in the trenches. Um, where I want to go about this now is talking about your coaching program. So yeah. you have students across the States. We kind of glazed over it, but can you tell me the name of your program? And if someone's that's listening is interested in learning more and maybe networking with you and getting involved, how would they do that? Yeah. So we uh, run the residential assisted living Academy every like six to eight weeks here in Phoenix, Arizona. We go through everything A to Z on how to do this. It's a three day training. It's super robust. We're talking about everything from raising capital to marketing the home, hiring the right key staff members, what you need to say and do on your tours with the new families who are you know, potentially moving their loved ones in. We break it down with memory care versus just assisted living. We do asset protection and syndication topics. We even talk about remote ownership because 31% of care home owners are remote owners. They own a home in a state or area where they don't live. So we really go through A to Z how to do this. Um, those trainings are awesome. We cap them at like 150 people and they fill up and sell out every six to eight weeks. So it's a lot of fun because you're also getting to network with cool real estate investors and medical professionals, even from all across the country. So a lot of partnerships are formed at those events as well. Um, so those are really fun. And then it's really built to be, you're learning everything you need to know at that training. And many people have taken that and gone out and gotten their care homes up and running. But we do offer mentoring and coaching after the fact as well for those who want that additional handholding. They want to be able to call our staff and our team 24 seven and have access to softwares and apps and documents and all that stuff just to pay for speed. So we have that available, but the three day is built to kind of be that end all be all package that all you need to get out there and go make it happen. I love it. Thank you. So based on where you are now and all that you've built, what is the, the next couple of years look like for you? Do you have a, like an end goal with your business? Are you looking to do this forever? Kind of give me a size and scope of the future. You know, I feel very uh, blessed, like we talked about in the beginning of this, that when my dad uh, passed, that his three businesses passed down to me. That came a lot sooner than I was expecting because he passed quite young. Um, but it's one of those things that now, you know, a lot of people kind of, when that happened, they looked and they said, why are you going to keep training on this? You now have three homes that are cash flowing between 10 and 20K a month. Like, you're good. You don't have to do anything for the rest of your life and you'll be fine. And you'll be able to pass your kids, you know, millions of dollars worth of real estate plus regular cash flow coming in every month. Like you don't have to do this anymore. You know that? 
And it really brought me back to our mission as a company that we created 10 years ago, which was to positively impact 10 million people by providing high quality assisted living in a residential home environment. You know, I might be fine, but there's so many other people who don't have the financial freedom that they want. They don't have the legacy that they want. And, you know, it's becoming more and more difficult to make money on traditional real estate strategies. This is one of those opportunities where I, I believe it is the opportunity of a lifetime, right? We all have a senior loved one who's going to need this. It's inevitable. We're all going to get involved in this one way or the other. Either you're going to be right, you know, lying in the bed or writing the check for someone who is, or you could be owning the real estate, operating the business, cash flowing. It's one of those things that doesn't really matter who you are. You're going to get involved in senior housing, but I want to show people that they have a choice and that they can choose to get involved sooner and provide solutions instead of deal with the crisis that it can be for so many families. So I really see us continuing to train and teach as many people as we can. I see us incorporating more tech, adding more softwares and apps and different things and really just helping elevate this industry. 10 years ago, there was no one training on this. Now there's new gurus popping up every day. And I kind of love it because we're all learning from each other. And listen, I don't care who you learn from. Find someone who speaks to you, who speaks your heart language. And that's the person that you should go to for advice, who lives the life you want to live and who, you know, makes sense to what you want, what ticks your boxes. I love that. And that's so true. We, uh, there's so many different cycles of the market too, and new people pop up, new people shut down. It's so interesting. And we've on social media, there's been a lot of people we, when we first started, we were just like learning from them and all of a sudden they're not posting anymore. Like where'd they go? You yeah. know what I mean? That new people pop up. It's just the changing of the guard. And so that's, that's really good. And I think the advice is great. It's like, there's, even if someone is teaching on your lane, it's who do you tick and vibe with? And who do you, like you said, who's living the life that you like, that you want and who has the same values as you do. Cause the value piece is interesting. Like there's a lot of people that are out here just doing this for money and it clear to you, clear to me that you're not doing that. So I love it. Um, one other thing I wanted to touch on before we wrap up is we mentioned like the, the changing of the guard and passing down the businesses from one family member to another. I know that was way back in the beginning of the episode. So forever remembered that it was something that, that meant something to me. And I want to bring it back up. Is like, how did you go about that? And in terms of like, you know, First of all, I'm sorry that your father passed. It's, you know, a part of life, but it's sad. And it's like, you know, people, people mourn and they go through it. And some people are fortunate enough to have something passed down. Other people are not. And you, it's what, what, what do they say? The quote is with great power comes great responsibility, right? It's, it was passed down to you. So can you maybe take us through what happened in that moment? You're like, were you prepped for it? Was he, were you kind of getting molded before he passed to, to run this business? Or are you just like, whoa. I got to figure this thing out. And I know that was a lot, but I'm just curious on like how the heck you navigated this circumstance. Yeah. I worked with him uh, six years prior to his passing. So I had six years of really, when I started with him, he had his uh, one, one of his care homes. So I was there during the acquisition of the other two. So uh, there along the process and was able to kind of see that happen. And when we started the Academy, it was him, I, and one other employee. And we now have, a team of almost 40 employees. So I was able to kind of build that um, with him and really be that integrator to his visionary. So I'm blessed that I was able to be there along that ride. So the transition was actually more seamless than it would be for someone who it was just thrown in their lap. But I do think having systems in place also helped aid that. Because going through probate or going through all of these different changing of the guards, like legally, you need to have your asset protection in alignment. That's why we we work with Prime Corporate Services. I think you guys know them too. But yeah, we do. the best, they're the best because so many real estate investors, if, if they went today, their kids would be screwed. Like you have to have this stuff down pat and know who's getting what and what's happening and all of that stuff. So I leave it to the experts and we work with them and they come to the, to the three day training to help a lot of our clients really build that out. But we relied so much on the legal system and what we had laid out. Like we sat down and we'd have conversations. Hey, what if dad dot, dot, dot. And then we, we'd lay it out. This is who gets this percentage. This is who gets this. This is who gets this. So we all knew and he wasn't sick. Nothing happened. He literally died of COVID within two weeks of getting it to passing. So this was a, it was a shock. 
But we, because of those years of prior conversations of us saying, if we're going to work in this business, we want to know what happens. Like you could get hit by a bus. You could get, you know, choke on a peanut and die. Like it doesn't matter. I'm kind of morbid in the sense that I'm always thinking of what happens if someone passes, but it's true. You, you have to really go down that nasty path in your head of saying like, they're gone. There's no asking what was the password on that? Or how did you pay for that? Is there a secret bank account behind some drawer? Like we need to know it all. And that was really important to have those conversations up front. I love this conversation. We I never touched on it on the podcast before, so I'm glad it's today. It's so interesting. And maybe this is just because we both have fathers that had businesses and it's just perfectly aligned, but it's so interesting in certain families, like Things are talked about or things are not talked about. And I think there's a lot of people out there that either their parents have a business or their parents have real estate or their parents have even just retirement accounts, right? And every, you know, I say every, but there's there's a large majority of of families, at least um, in the generation before us that are like, hush, hush, no one talks about money. And where we're like, whatever, here's what, here's our net worth. Here's what, you know, so take take what you will with that. But I say this to say, it becomes a shock for a lot of people when their parents pass, they're like, what do I do? I didn't know they had this or they had nothing. And like, I have to figure out X, Y, Z. So it's just so interesting. And, and I wish there was a way to kind of broach the conversation or bring it up to them without being like, Hey, I'm trying to take everything from you. It's like, listen, I just want to know how we're going to have to navigate when the, this day finally comes. And it's, it's, it's just a hard conversation to have. I don't know. I really don't know how to start it. And so I'm glad that at least you shared your story because it's, it's smart to have at least a runway, no matter when the time is. I think you mentioned the peanut, the peanut, which is funny. Like you never know. You could get hit by a bus. That's what I always use. I'm like, you never know. Some random thing could happen. So now that I'm a business owner, I, and we just had a, uh, we have a 15 month old and I'm like, you know what? She's going to know everything. You can have all my passwords. Here's what we have, you know, and we've set it up to a point where it's like, you, you have the trust, you have everything, you know, it's, there's an order to things. There's so when order. things happen, there's like, okay, here's, here's what you do day one and just follow it. Go talk to this person. Whereas a lot of people are just like, well, what do I do? I don't know. I and it having, so I know it went down a, maybe a more morbid track than we no, probably. But that's good. And I'm glad you have that for your own family and if you if you are running a family business, regard oh, any business, but specifically a family business, I always tell people like I love to work with friends and family. I don't want to work with enemies and strangers. Family, friends and family are the best. But always think, you know, it's not about the trust we have. It's you know, I don't trust your spouse's lawyer because what happened when you're gone? I'm now dealing with potentially your spouse or potentially their lawyer, or if you get divorced or whatever it is. So partnerships are so important to go through the nasty. You just have to go through the nasty because that's what it can become. Money divides people, businesses divide people, and you don't want to lose relationships in an already emotional and heightened time. No, I don't think I could have said it any better. It's when it comes to money, things change and you hear it all the time. There's always these war stories with the, the perfect partnership. And you, like you mentioned, it's always, the, it, not always, a good portion of it is like, you guys could be fine. Like if we were partners, everything's good. You get the part, the spouse involved and they just have a different way and they yeah. emotions get swirled in. And it's like, well, I have to do this because my spouse wants me to do that. It's, it's always good to you have to have a great legal team. That's at the end of the day, you have to have a great legal team, put things in writing, have them signed. So that way everything has an order to it. it yeah. And it becomes a lot of people don't do this until you need to do it. Yeah. But if you're proactive versus reactive, you're going to be set up and, and it's happened to us so many times on, on different ways. And we are like, well, thank God we had this in writing or thank God we did this. It's just, no one tells you when you first get into business, like the number one or maybe top three to five person on your team is have an attorney. Like you, yeah. you need to, and it's a big expense and it gets scary because people are like legal fees. It's just worth having someone in your arsenal to get it prepped and for ex perfect examples like this. So um, I'm glad we touched on it. Is there anything else you want to talk about on RAL? We talked about the coaching program. You gave us an example deal, your whole timeline of acquiring the business. You're killing it. I'm just, did we leave anything off the table? You know, I think if anyone listening is is looking for something that's going to take them to the next level or the strategies that they have been doing just aren't cutting it anymore, this is an avenue that is worth looking into because you may have a property that already works for it or 
now that you've heard me say these different stipulations on kind of what to look for, you're like, ah, oh, I, I passed one of those, you know, and that could have been perfect for it. So if it is ticking your boxes and it's making sense, definitely check it out. We've got a ton of free resources. I've written books. We've got webinars. We have calls available all for free, ral101.com. So check it out and, and connect with us. And I'm happy to answer any of your individual questions as well, because it is a, a nuanced business. There are so many small things and I don't want any of that to get left out as well. So I know I make it sound easy, but I, I love that you pointed out, no, there's hoops. And I'm like, yes, I love the hoops. <laughs> I, I think it's great. And uh, you're clearly a master of your craft. And I think it's important. You got to call out the hoops in the beginning. And because if you do that, more people will understand it's, it's real life. You know, there's Nothing is as easy as it seems and the shiny object syndrome gets a lot of people in, but I do think this is a very viable investing, um, I guess, platform opportunity strategy, if you will, for people that are looking to get into real estate. And it seems like you've spearheaded this thing. I, I have really like, we've done over 200 episodes and this is the first time we touched on it. And so I've been super intrigued the whole time. Very, now I'm educated. And so we'll definitely check your, your, all of your books out. We'll check the podcast out, or excuse me, the, um, you have a couple of other podcasts I want to touch on too. I know you did one for bigger pockets, Ryan Pineda. So you've been on some really big shows talking about it. And, uh, those episodes were phenomenal, but thank you for gracing me with your presence today. I had a blast. Well, thanks for having me. It was great to be here. Absolutely. So, um, if you want to connect with Isabel, we'll drop all of her links in the show notes and, uh, We'll see you next week. Thanks for tuning in this week to the Wealth Juice Podcast. If you liked what you heard, please leave us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts, subscribe, and share with friends. The more ratings we get, the more ears we'll get on our show. And in turn, we'll be able to provide you with more high-quality guests. You can also find us on Instagram and YouTube at Wealth Juice Official, where we post daily tips, tricks, and document our own journey towards financial freedom.